Hello everyone and welcome to another lockdown interview. Today I'm delighted to be joined by Sven Erik Buström of UAE Team Emirates. This is Sven Erik Buström's sixth year on the World Tour and he began his career with the Norwegian continental side Team Österhus Ridley in 2012 before moving to Katusha in 2015 after a successful stage. Buström grabbed headlines in 2014 in Ponferrada when he became the under-23 world champion on the road after a successful attack and beating many of the favorites on the day. Buström has since then established himself as a reliant domestique for riders such as Alexander Kristoff, but he is also himself developing into a really good classic rider. Last to discuss in a very interesting career, so without further ado, here is the interview with Sven Erik Buström. Good morning, Sven. How are you? And where are you right now? I'm fine. I'm uh, I'm in my in my house in Stavanger, Norway. So uh, yeah, I'm enjoying the this time uh, where I can stay home with my family and don't race so much. But yeah, I also miss miss going back to races. How has the lockdown been for you in Norway? And how have you kind of kept yourself fit? Yeah, it's been a special uh, yeah time in life. Uh, I think for everybody, but yeah, for me personally, it was quite good timing because my my first child was born two months ago, so I uh, could stay home and this family time and uh, yeah, um, be at the the birth of my first uh, first uh, child. So that was amazing. And uh, normally, I should uh, I was supposed to race uh, Ronde van Flanders uh, that day, so I was uh, kind of lucky in uh, in all of that, taking the circumstances. Uh, yeah. Uh, wasn't that the reason why your uh, schedule beforehand was not the Giro, it was the Tour de France? Yeah, I uh, I told the team management early on that, uh, yeah, uh, around, uh, yeah, after the classics, the Northern classics, uh, I really want to stay at home because uh, I want to uh, attend my, my first child's birth. They respected that, so uh, yeah, that's uh, where uh, actually, uh, yeah. The plan was never to do the Giro, but uh, the plan was always to do the, the do the tour. Looking at this revised calendar, has your program changed much? Are you just kind of following Alexander Kristoff or? Yeah, actually, uh, they ended up changing um, Alex's program, uh, but my have actually stayed the same. So, yeah, I will still do the tour, and then after the the classics, which is now in, in October, Alex was uh, planning to race the Giro. But uh, he also got uh, twins uh, almost during the same time like I, uh, I got my first child. So uh, he uh, he was also kind of lucky in all this. And uh, then um, then they they rescheduled his program to, to fit with the classics because then he couldn't do the Giro anymore. So yeah, that's why we now are both on the tour team and um, yeah. <laughs> I'm busy at home with our families. Yeah, this year you're one of the riders who have raced a bit and you were at one of the, well, not controversial, but more memorable races, the UAE Tour, where you guys were locked down and it was the first time coronavirus kind of was exposed to the peloton. How was the whole ordeal like? Yeah, it was a pretty absurd situation down there. It was uh, the first couple of days we we kind of like we didn't knew anything actually because it was so new to everybody this virus we heard about it from china but suddenly it was uh, some cases uh, in our hotel in in abu dhabi and uh, yeah we were told we could fly home the day after after we had like a, a negative test which uh, i had but then uh, yeah suddenly we were uh, we had to stay for for two weeks in the quarantine in, inside the hotel room so <laughs> And uh, yeah, when you think when you think back to it, it's it's yeah, it's not so crazy anymore because now uh, when this virus uh, is all over the world, uh, you understand uh, the importance of these uh, health measures they had to they had to make down there. You also did the Tour Down Under. You were eleventh overall. Kind of was that a good race for you? And do you like racing in heat? Yeah, I was uh, pretty happy with my my start in Down Under. I've been racing that race. Uh, this was my third year, uh, and uh, like the profile suits me pretty well. But yeah, in general, I'm I'm a guy for uh, yeah a domestic who um, ride in support for uh, riders like Ulisi and uh, this year's case uh, Philipson for the sprints. But uh, yeah, I, I found my legs, uh, they were pretty pretty good at that moment. So yeah, I just kept on riding after I did my work. And uh, in the end, I, I got uh, an 11th place in the general. So yeah, that showed uh, I started the season at least uh, in good condition. But uh, 
it's a bit uh, pity that uh, we had to stop a few weeks later and uh, yeah, stay at our homes. Yeah, you said you're domestic um, largely for, well, Christopher sometimes as well. But is there not races that you kind of see yourself, because you're still fairly young, that you could kind of target in the future? Yeah, I think uh, like if you take uh, Tour Down Under, for example, uh, Vinolonga climb is almost like 10 minutes. So that's like kind of a maximum limits on the climb, like three, three maximum four Ks. So that's that's kind of races I can I can perform uh, in, I think, uh, with my own own ambitions. So in the future, I hope to perform well in, in that kind of race and also hillier races in, in Europe and stages, at least in Grand Tours. I don't believe I can really be up there in the really, really high mountains. What about the Ardent Classics? You haven't ridden Liège, Baston Liège yet, but is that something you would like to ride in the future? Yeah, definitely. I, uh, I have a dream about that. And uh, I raced the under 23 version uh, one time and it was like, uh, I, I think, yeah, it's it's kind of well suited for my abilities that kind of race if I'm in top condition and can uh, can yeah maybe I can show myself there in the future but uh, yeah so far it's been colliding a bit with uh, with the cobblestone classics it's been a pretty heavy program one year I did Amstel and Flesh after but it's yeah it's it's kind of hard to do all the couple classics and then continue in the Ardennes and yeah then. It allows less recovery for you to to be at the top level for the next part of the season. The last time you did Paris Bay, you actually finished twenty seventh. So you must have a player for the Coles as well. Yeah, I love uh, I love that kind of races, and uh, it's something special with the uh, history and everything about all of that. And uh, yeah, my first uh, Paris Roubaix went pretty well. I was happy with uh, that performance, and uh, I was in the breakaway. And unfortunately, I couldn't follow Sylvain Delier when he followed Sagan when he came up. He eventually got second, but uh, yeah, it's a bit pity I couldn't follow there. But in the end, uh, it was a good uh, debut for me in uh, Paris Roubaix. How do the couples um, between uh, Ronde van Ronderen and the Paris Roubaix? How are they different? Paris Roubaix is uh, yeah, you obviously have no climbs, so it's it's pretty much about uh, <laughs> getting in position into the. It's also in, in Ronde van Flanderen. You need to get in position for the. The couple sectors, but uh, I will say Paris Robert, you need to take care of your aerodynamics, you need to save energy. Uh, maybe some places you don't think you need to need, uh, you don't uh, thinking about need uh, saving energy. And for example, in um, in Flanders, you can have some parts where you can recover a bit. It's harder that it's harder for that in Paris Robert because. Uh, Normally, it splits the first cobbled sector, and you have no uh, time to allow recovery in between. <laughs> so that's uh, make it more steady. I think the the pace is more steady and and tougher until the finish. Is the battle for position a lot harder in the classics races compared to like a normal stage race? Yeah, I would I would say so. You can like the classics is kind of crazy because uh, you the whole peloton is like sprinting full gas just just uh, to get in position before a climb with maybe 100 k's to go. So it's kind of, you're doing, yeah, maybe 10 times uh, a mass uh, sprint finish, in, for example, a Grand Tour. And then you need to repeat the effort after uh, on the climb. So it's kind of hard mentally and you are pretty exhausted. And also in your head after you've done a classic race, for example, yeah, the hard, especially the toughest one, like Gent Velgen, Flanders and, and Robert. So you actually, you joined um, UAE Team Emirates in 2018 from Katusha. What was that like um, change for you? And it seemed like you left Katusha just at the right time as well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah, kind of a sad story actually that, uh, that Katusha had to close down uh, before this season. Because it was a great team when, when I was there. Uh, yeah, I was. I had three really good years, uh, but in the end, there was time for a move. They had like, I, I thought they had like a different plans going on with different kind of riders, and I, I ended up following my good friend uh, Alexander Christoph to UAE. UAE is also like a really, really nice team to be in. It's uh, when I started there, it was, it felt like a pure Italian team actually, because most of the guys were Italians in management, staff, uh, also the riders. But uh, the transition is made now to be more uh, internationally. Now we have people from all over the world and everybody speaks uh, English. So it's like a, 
yeah, it's a really like an open uh, uh, international community where uh, you really feel you belong in. Yeah, going back to the beginning, you started with the team uh, Osta, Osta House Ridley. Osta, Osta. Uh, Osta House Ridley, yes. Yeah, uh, how was that? Um, you know, while you were coming, how, like joining in 2012, how was it coming into a continental setup? It was, uh, for me, it was a really smooth transition because um, it was the local continental team. So I knew all the riders from before. I used to train with them and uh, yeah, my local club uh, where I grew up in here, it was uh, had a really like big connection to that team. So it was kind of just, uh, yeah, taking a step forward, but in the same environment kind of. So it was, uh, I had also three or uh, I think, yeah, three and a half great years there with the uh, really, really nice uh, people around me. And I could continue to have my the same trainer and uh, yeah, uh, supporting guys around me, and that was really important. And uh, yeah, it, eventually it was a really nice uh, way to end uh, end uh, time in that team with uh, winning the worlds. Yeah, what was that world championships like? Were you coming in thinking you were one of the favorites, or actually not? I was pretty surprised myself that I won because uh, yeah, I. I I'd done some good races uh, that uh, all the when I was under 23 I I did some some good wrestles but I was I was really never close to winning the really big ones I felt I won uh, this uh, race in Frankfurt um, the under 23 version there so I was I knew I could I could uh, do something big on a really good day but uh, I was like never even close to winning the, the Tour de l'Avenir or any race like that so um yeah so coming into the worlds that year i was pretty like uh, i was considered like an underdog i guess and um the favorite was uh was caleb ewan and the whole australian team uh, rode for him and uh, yeah i tried uh one attack and that uh worked out pretty well in the end what was it like wearing the rainbow jersey the next year? Uh, actually, I, I wore the rainbow jersey on the podium after the Worlds, and after that, I never <laughs> wore it <laughs> because then I already had a contract with Katusha, and uh, and uh, yeah, I um, my my career in under twenty three was, was it was my last under twenty three race, so I I never raced uh, with in that uh, ranks again. So <laughs> <That's> it, <laughs> it was. Uh, the, the jersey is on, is on my wall now here in my house, so uh, I can I can look up on it. But uh, I never had a experience to to ride with it actually, so uh, that was a pity. But uh, I guess I have to win the um, the elite worlds one time to to have that feeling. <laughs> what was it like being a stagiaire at Katusha? Uh, it was uh, it was special and uh, really interesting, of course. Uh, I did one race only actually before the Worlds. I did Arctic Race of Norway with Katusha. So uh, yeah, I, I I got along from the from the first time with the staff and, and the riders there. But I was also nervous, you know, uh, yeah, being a shy Norwegian coming into that uh, great uh, Walter team uh, with this uh, Italian Russian mentality was uh, was a bit scary also, but. Uh, yeah, in the end, when you join the team, it's like a family. They are all really, really nice guys, all of them, and they they welcomed me really well to the team. In your second year, yeah. you did the World Tour. What was it like doing your first Grand Tour? Was it a whole completely different experience? I think it was my hardest three weeks ever on the bike. I suffered a lot that three weeks. It was actually much harder than I was thinking. Yeah, it was actually like physically. I think I I had the, the level. But mentally, for the head to, to to repeat the same thing every day for three weeks was was hard for me. But uh, I was always thinking that I need to I need to finish this to get better in the future. So that my plan was so never I I never doubt uh, about quitting or anything. So there was I had just one goal and that was to reach Madrid and uh, finish my first Grand Tour. What was the 18 like? I think maybe you were thinking about my uh, oh, third yeah. Welter. Yeah, I think I think so. Okay, so yeah, the, yeah. the third Welter on stage 18, what was that like? Yeah, in 2017, I 
or 18, I think. 18. Yeah, it, it was intense that day. Uh, I really, really hoped to win that stage. And I was, for sure, I was disappointed to be second. But in the end, I, uh, I was also happy because, yeah, I, I, haven't been, I haven't been feeling great in the second week of the Vuelta. So, yeah, a couple of days before I was struggling. And then I remember the day before I went in that breakaway, I was feeling really good. And I told myself, the next stage, I'm going to go in the breakaway and I win the stage. And I also told my, my sport director and he was like, we will see. And then I went in the breakaway and I was really, really close to win. So that would be a... That would be actually a fairy tale story if I if I did, but uh, yeah, in the end I I was caught caught up in a bit uh, tactics with uh, Jelle Valais, and he um, he was uh, smarter than me in the in that final kilometer. He stayed on my wheel, and uh, I had to pull. And uh, if I didn't pull, we would have been caught. So it was uh, either I tried to win and most likely be second, or uh, I I gamble and uh, maybe lose everything. So. When you're in a breakaway with other riders, do you kind of know all the, the abilities or is your DS kind of radioing through who's the good sprinter and who's the good time trialer? Yeah, I, I know them a bit, but uh, I'm not like a guy who do too much research also. For sure, I got some guiding by my sport director, but uh, I think we were pretty like 50-50 who was going to win that sprint. It wasn't like a clear favorite or anything. So. Uh, it was just about uh, yeah, when, you, when you have 10 seconds and there's two Ks to go, you need to make a decision. Either you work together or you, uh, or you gamble. Uh, eventually, he gambled and uh, I, was a bit, I was not too cold in my head. So I, I panicked a bit. I started my sprint early and had to pull also the last kilometer. And then uh, yeah, he ended up winning the stage. And that was a really smart move of him. And uh, he did really well. But it's also... Like something, uh, yeah. I feel at least you owe me a beer or something. <laughs> so last year you did your first Tour de France. How did that compare to the Welter? And was, is the hype? Can you kind of feel that the fans are more attentive? Or yeah, for sure. In, in the Tour de France is the biggest uh, event, so there's like more media attention, more people, more pressure, and also the racing is a bit more aggressive, I think, uh, compared to the Welter. In Welter, you kind of can have some some days easier, you know, you can uh, maybe relax a bit on uh, a sprint stage in the middle there and you can uh, you can ease down a bit. In the tour, it's impossible. There is like full gas racing every day, like it's a classic. So, uh, and also the like riders are more aggressive. You fight harder for positions. And uh, yeah, it's just like uh, more chaos, I think. But uh, I really enjoyed it. I didn't have one day where I, uh, was bored, you know. In Vuelta, you can have a, a day or two where you feel and yeah, you miss home and you be a little bit bored. But in the tour, it's like full gas every day, and you don't, you, yeah, you almost cannot think because it's uh, so many people and uh, cars and people around you, and yeah, it's completely crazy. How do you kind of save energy to get through the whole Grand Tour? Yeah, it's a tricky question because uh, I try my best to to save a bit. Wherever I can save a bit of energy, but it's it's difficult because uh, yeah, probably for some riders the best is to just lay down on the bed and, uh, and relax. But when I'm really tired, I also struggle to to sleep really well. So yeah, it's uh, I think if you can enjoy the moment, you also feel more relaxed. So maybe if you are happy, you can have share a laugh with your teammates. That's also a way to. Um, yeah, to reduce stress and uh, re reduce fatigue, I think. And we had a really good time during last year's Tour de France with in inside the team. We are a great group of riders in the Tour, and even the results was not so good, but in the end, we kept our... Uh, the environment was really good to be there, the bus, and uh, we, we, were, we were laughing a lot, so we had a good time. So with this year's Tour de France, how is the team going to change when you have, like, probably one of the most talented stage races in your team and Christoph and Gaviria. How is that going to be balanced? I think this year's Tour de France favorites the climbers. So for sure, uh, Tade is a great talent and he has great potential to perform well in this year's Tour de France. But he's also 
really young, you know. Uh, he was third in last year's Vuelta, so he already proved himself that he can be up there. But I think the team doesn't give him too much pressure. They will, like, try to let him maybe go for a stage. Uh, if he's up there in GC, that's great, you know, but there's no... no big, big pressure. And I think he's just going to enjoy his first Tour de France. And there's up to me and uh, the rest of us to support him as good as possible. And additional, there are some few sprint stages, not so much this year. There the plan is to go for uh, for Alex, I guess. Uh, so he also can maybe grab some a stage or two. Uh, that would be great. But uh, the main focus is actually on the on the climbers in this year's, this year's Tour de France. Do you think it'll be a bit strange having all the races in such a compact nature? Well, you won't really have that much time to rest if you're doing a significant amount of racing. Yeah, I, I thought about that. For example, when when we finish the Tour de France, we have like uh, around yeah, 10 days or two weeks before we head into the classics period with, uh, with a lot of one-day races, where you also need to be turned on in the head and you need to really focus hard. So if you're really mentally tired after the Tour de France, it can be... It can be hard to change that attitude on it again uh, when you start to race uh, cobble classics. So it's going to be a challenge, but I'm I'm up to it, you know, and I, I work really hard also, yeah, to prepare myself for that. But how it goes, we, it, the time will show. It's uh, it's going to be difficult to predict how it will be, but um, hopefully we can we can do well. How is your training like, considering like you're kind of all-rounder you're good at the classics and you're good at other things so how do you kind of what does a week for you look like training wise yeah it's 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 changing a bit from week to week of course like everybody but uh we have like a training uh, group around here in stavanger with me alex and some low riders and now the team is called team coop before it was my my former team, Osterhus Ridley. But uh, yeah, we have a, such a good environment in our training group. Actually, here you can you can meet up at, at one point, a training point we have uh, every day at 10 a.m. and you find riders, uh, good riders to ride with. So yeah, normally normally I train quite a lot. I, I put down a lot of hours, also with some intensity. So it's not like I'm uh, lying on the couch and uh, and resting. Of the races, I, I guess I'm yeah training maybe a bit more than other riders uh, in the professional peloton. But I always done, and since I was junior rider, I've I've been up to one one thousand one hundred hours a year in training. So I'm used to it, and um, yeah, if if my dream is to to be up there in the in the harder races, one day races and classics, uh, up to seven hours races. So that's why we. We train a lot there, and we we hope that uh, yeah, Chris, Christoph all, all uh, already showed that uh, this works for him, and uh, hopefully it will uh, will work for me also one day. Uh, you actually live, as you said, in Norway, which nowadays seems a bit different to a lot of the pros. Like a lot of the Danish pros live down in Girona. So did you never consider moving down to Spain or France or Italy or something like that? I was never in doubt that uh, yeah, Norway is, is my my country and uh, I'm going to live. So yeah, I was never thinking about moving to Spain or France or anything because uh, yeah, people, many people ask, ask me the same question and how can you live in Norway in the winter, especially with all the snow and uh, and uh, cold uh, weather conditions but in the end it's like kind of yeah one month november half december i stay at home and then i fly to training camps i fly to races and uh, then i'm yeah i fly back to norway for uh, a week or two and yeah, i can always survive a week or two with uh, with cold weather conditions for me it's not a problem it's uh, i can also go in the, the roller if it's really bad so yeah I, I like Norway. Here's my family. Here's my friends. So, yeah, I'm really happy with that decision. <laughs> Do you think living in a colder climate kind of gives you an edge in the spring classics? And I'm also thinking about the World Championships last year where Mats Peterson won. Uh, you fin you were one of the finishers. There wasn't a lot of finishers that day. Uh, it might be true, but not necessarily, I think, because it's not like... I'm used to train in the rain and, and cold weather conditions, but I don't like it. So it's uh, it's kind of, I do what I have to do, but uh, yeah, you see also, like if you if you live in Spain and, uh, or Italy or France or whatever, you, you can also ride well in, in bad weather conditions, but maybe we are a bit more used to it. 
I don't know, but uh, yeah, I think uh, it might be um, a good thing, but not necessarily. So Norway have started like you have a lot of good riders right now, but you also have a lot of good races like the Arctic Tour of Norway, the Tour of Norway, the Tour de Fjords. What's it like racing in Norway as a Norwegian? It's pretty cool because the interest in here in Norway is really, uh, really high now. People follow uh, cycling almost like cross-country skiing, which is almost the biggest sport in Norway. So uh, yeah, the, there's a lot of people watching the race and uh, the media sends almost everything on television. So uh, the same with the Tour de France. So there's like, a lot of attention from Norwegian fans and that's it's great. And it's also cool to, cool to race on uh, home soil, you know, you know the roads a bit, especially when we ride um, or when we race Tour of Norway, because then uh, I know all the roads nearby my home. So it's kind of cool to show the international peloton uh, where you live and where your training roads are. How do you feel about the riders that you have in Norway now? Because you have like a lot of riders on the world tour. And what do you kind of think influenced that? Yeah, there's been more and more world tour riders from Norway actually like progressing every year now. I don't know for sure how many we have now, but there's like a lot of good riders in Norway for the moment. And especially also with the, with a the new UNOX team uh, coming up. Now they are a pro team, what it's called for the moment. And uh, yeah, that team can really, uh, they, this, this team really have potential to be uh, a Walter team in the future because uh, the organization is good, the management is good, and also they have so many talented riders. So I think the future looks really bright for Norwegian cycling. And uh, yeah, hopefully already, yeah, already last year and this year we can, we can prove that. Final question, what was kind of your inspiration or who was the, your inspiration to start cycling? And you have a cycling hero. I started cycling when I was 10 years old. So it's, uh, it's mo maybe not so acceptable to say, but like my biggest idol the first year was Lance Armstrong because he was the best. And we didn't know about his like fraud or, or cheat. But yeah, he gave me a lot of inspiration. Uh, of course, we, we didn't knew at that time what, what he actually done. But um, so it's kind of uh, strange to look back at, but started with him. And then, of course, also Tour Rusold. He was uh, the best Norwegian cyclist at this time. So he also proved that uh, you can come from Norway and you can win uh, several stages in the Tour de France and eventually the Worlds also. He showed the way for, uh, for the rest of us and, uh, yeah, gave me the inspiration to, um, to yeah, be a cyclist and uh, live 100% uh, after that. All right, Sven, thank you very much for a very interesting interview. We'll definitely look out for you in the World Tour. Uh, I can't wait to see you in the Ardennes Classics as well. Thank you. Uh, good time to be here. Thanks. That's it for this lockdown interview with Sven Erik Bustrom. If you're new to the channel, make sure to subscribe to not miss out on any upcoming videos. And why not check out some of my other videos, such as I did with his teammate, Alexander Kristov, or his other fellow countrymen, Tobias Foss. And as always, thank you for watching and see you next time.